Well, thank you very much um, for the kind introduction and for the wonderful couple of days um, that I've um, had in Singapore. I believe we are at a critical turning point. We are at a crossroads. The cards are being reshuffled. And it is the right point now to think about the future of Salafi jihadism. And what I want to do is to talk about where we are, how we, how we got here. I want to then, in the spirit of this conference, lay out a best case scenario. If everything worked out wonderfully, how would it look? And then I want to throw a few spanners into the works and show you what can go wrong and why I believe these outcomes are things to watch out for. But let me first start with where we are and how we got here. How we got here is very briefly and easily explained. It starts with Syrian conflict in 2011. You had information technology, which, as has been pointed out many times over the past few days, has really magnified that conflict and has also promoted particular terrorist groups that have reached out to get recruits from all over the world. And of course, you had with so-called Islamic State, a group that has deliberately and very consciously pursued a territorial project, perhaps one of the first groups that has done so consistently and on the same scale that ISIS has done. And as a result then, you had ISIS, often also referred to as the so-called Islamic State, you had the creation of a transnational movement, and this has also been mentioned. Foreign fighters, over 30,000 from 100 different countries, have gone to send Iraq in order to support and become part of ISIS. Uh, you had a declaration of the so-called caliphate in the summer of 2014 that was also, in territorial terms, its peak. And if you look at the map here, which is a map from a couple of months ago, you see the areas in green that used to be part of the so-called caliphate, but have been captured back over the past three years. On the Iraqi side, 70% of the territory that ISIS held at the peak of its so-called territorial expansion in the mid of 2014 have already been recaptured on the Syrian side, 50%. So the caliphate is no longer what it used to be. In fact, we've seen a slow but steady decline of territory, Mosul nearly being recaptured and Raqqa now being encircled. So that is where we are and how we got there. What is going to happen from now on? And that's why I think it's important to think about the future now, because as I said right at the beginning, I do think the cards are being reshuffled. What is the best case scenario? Best case scenario is that ISIS killed jihadism. And this hypothesis is based on the following. It's based, of course, on, first of all, the decline of territory that I've just described, the end of a contiguous entity called the Islamic State, the end of a territorial entity which we may see by 2019. I don't think it's going to ha happen quite as quickly as many people predict, but by the end of 2019, we might see the end of ISIS as a territorial entity. And following from that is the decline of its army and of its support, the decline of people. The locals will turn away. Many of them only ever joined ISIS out of opportunistic reasons. Of the foreign fighters, 20 to 25 percent have been killed already. By the end of the conflict, perhaps 50 percent will have been killed. Of the returnees, many are disillusioned with their experience. Only a small percentage will turn up in other conflict hotspots and recruit others. Only a small percentage will be terrorist operatives with a mission to attack. And of course, that small percentage, hopefully by 2019-20, our countries will have been prepared for. They will be able to take care and identify them with a mix of repression and prevention. 
And the third aspect of the best case scenario is then following that from that, and I think that's almost the most important aspect, the decline of the underlying ideology. Let's not forget the declaration of the caliphate in mid-2014 was a momentous event. And its sharp and almost instant decline is an equally momentous blow, not only to the organization behind it, but to the entire ideology. If the Islamic State, this, the new so-called caliphate, cannot survive for more than just three years, what legitimacy does it really have? And indeed, if you look on Telegram and on other platforms, already some of the supporters are asking these questions. Was this Islamic State really the Islamic State? And of course, over the next months and years, we will see many more of the failings of the so-called Islamic State being exposed, with more people returning and talking about them. They will turn jihadism into a toxic brand. Of course, the decline will not be instant. Tax may still increase in frequency for a year or two, but what we're seeing now are essentially the death pangs. They are the last efforts by a dying body to still keep alive but make no mistake about it, the body is dying and we will see the end of jihadism by 2022, 2023 perhaps. And that's in fact in line with a famous theory of terrorism, the wave theory of ther terrorism, which basically says that terrorist waves that come and go, no doubt there will be a new thing eventually, a new ideology in due course that youthful revolutionaries will attach themselves to. But it's impossible to say now what it is going to be, but given everything that has happened, it is likely not going to be jihadism, right? That's how it's going to happen. Does everyone agree? Probably not. So I'll have to stay on stage for a few minutes more and tell you perhaps why some of the assumptions in this scenario are perhaps not as realistic as I tried to make them sound. There's three assumptions that I want to argue with, and I'm kind of arguing with myself here. The first factor that I don't think the best case scenario really considers sufficiently enough is the diffusion of ISIS. There's actually no sign that the 30,000 fighters or so will just disappear. And it's not clear that by the end of the conflict, half of them will have died or in fact that all the locals were just opportunistic recruits that will become turncoats and reintegrate. In fact, most serious analysts believe that ISIS will retain pockets and strongholds. No, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, that in fact the caliphate uh, will be based, uh, continue to be based on holdouts like in the late 2000s, waiting for the right moment to return. And the foreign fighters are, in fact, the nucleus, if you want, of a massive global network of well-trained, brutalized fighters. In fact, that is already bigger than the network than Al-Qaeda ever had, and perhaps bigger than any terrorist organization that ever existed. And no doubt they will disperse and turn up in a lot of other conflicts, just like they did on a smaller scale after the Afghan conflict in the 1980s. The Afghan conflict in the 1980s, fighting against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, the conflict ended in 1988. Up to 20,000 people from all over the world had been mobilized. And of course, at the end of that conflict, people asked themselves, what next? And they went to other conflict, and they tried to return to their home countries. And the veterans of that conflict turned up everywhere, from Chechnya to Bosnia to Algeria, in fact, to the Philippines. The Abu Sayyaf group is based on a fighter who fought in Afghanistan. And typically, wherever they turned up, they made the conflicts worse, they made the conflicts more extreme, more religious, fundamentalist, and more brutal. And some of them, in fact, did return to their home countries or nearby home countries. And whilst many were disillusioned, others were not and served as hubs for jihad and for terrorism and recruitment, like, in fact, in the case of the Paris and Brussels network, where eight out of the 10 attackers were former foreign fighters that had returned 
to their home countries with a mission to attack. Even in the case of the recent attacks in Manchester, the perpetrator had probably trained in Libya. The difference to Afghanistan in the 1980s is that we now have information technology, and this has been mentioned a few times, that in fact the caliphate is even more likely to survive, albeit in a virtual state. We have greater numbers, not 20,000, but over 30,000 people who have participated in the conflict, and we have an ideology that is even more aggressive and at the same time more flexible. It is not always, and I think that's a problem with forecasting in terrorism, terrorism forecasters always assume that attacks are always getting more complicated. In fact, what we've seen and what's been the secret, one of the secrets to ISIS's success is that it has made attacks more simple. And we have an aggressive ideology, but extreme flexibility when it comes to attacks in fact, attacks that are very difficult to prevent, especially when they are promoting um, people uh, getting cars or knives and randomly attacking people on their own. And this will particularly be problematic for countries, I would argue, in North Africa, from where many of the fighters have come from and to which they may return. Tunisia, which recruited 6,000 of the ISIS fighters, Libya and Egypt. This will play out over 10 years and Many of them will not immediately return, but first go to neighboring countries like Turkey, for example, from where they entered into Syria in the first place, just like a lot of the Afghan fighters after 1988 in the first instance went to Pakistan and stayed there until they had decided where they would finally go. So my prediction for the future of Turkey is in fact a gloomy one. I do think there will be a lot more instability. So the diffusion of ISIS is I think just as likely as what I described in the best case scenario. The second factor I want to briefly touch upon is the rise of other groups. In my view, it is a wrong assumption, but it is a typical Western assumption because we in the West have been particularly severely affected by ISIS, but it is a wrong assumption that it's all about ISIS. It's never been all about ISIS, even from a Western perspective, or even a South Asian perspective. Um, that's how it may have looked, but it's not true. Before ISIS, there was Jabhat al-Nusra. Jabhat al-Nusra didn't become ISIS in its entirety. Jabhat al-Nusra continues to exist, or its successes, and has not been affected by the decline of ISIS. On the contrary, it is deeply embedded in Idlib province or in the south of Syria. It has a different strategy. It has forged coalitions with other rebel groups which make it more difficult to attack Jabhat al-Nusra. It engages in no crass brutality, at least not as crass as ISIS does. It is more careful in its recruitment. It has good fighters. And whether we like it or not, if you go to the region, you talk to people, you ask Syrians in the border towns, as me and my colleagues have done, you will find out that they are actually quite popular for all the reasons that I've just mentioned. They will be much more difficult to dislodge from Syria than ISIS. So the focus um, is very much on ISIS, but Jabhat al-Nusra or similar groups are deeply embedded like ISIS in international networks. They have strong links with Al-Qaeda, both in terms of ideology and in terms of their personnel. And I do think two things might happen. The first is that Nusra might benefit from the leftovers of ISIS and expand both in numbers of people and territory because there's no solution to the Syrian conflict and Nusra cannot be expelled. And secondly, and the two are not mutually exclusive. Secondly, Nusra will continue to be successful in forging coalitions with other Salafist groups, such as, for example, Ahra al-Sham, which, which it has been trying to do for some time. Basically, what we've seen in the Syrian conflict over the past three years, and which should be of as much concern to all of us as the rise and fall of ISIS, is that the center of gravity of the opposition has slowly but steadily shifted towards a more extreme position. Jabhat al-Nusra, at the beginning of the conflict, four years ago, used to be the ugly cousin. You kind of know it existed. It was there. 
occasionally you needed it, but you didn't want to be seen with him. Now the ugly cousin has become the center of attention. Not only is Jabhat al-Nusra tolerated, it is the center of a lot of the coalition of the rebel coalitions that still oppose the Syrian government. So there has been a radicalization of the Syrian opposition, not only in terms of giving birth to ISIS, but also in terms of all the other rebel groups with a group like Jabhat al-Nusra, which has firm links to Al-Qaeda now being almost impossible to dislodge. What this means is not that ISIS killed jihadism, but that ISIS killed ISIS and other groups that in the jihadist camp stand to benefit, the most obvious candidate being Jabhat al-Nusra. Make no mistake, Nusra are no moderates or friends of the unbelievers. They only look good because right now there is someone else who looks even worse, which is ISIS. Once they have established themselves, they will try to reconstruct the Al-Qaeda network. Let me go to my third factor, the third development that I think the best case scenario is underestimating, and that is the threat of a larger war, an even larger war in the Middle East, a confessional sectarian confrontation between Sunnis and Shiites, parts of which we are already seeing. And that, in fact, could lead to the resurrection of ISIS. And that, I think, is, in fact, the black swan. If I had done these slides after the presentation of Peter Ho, I would have probably called it a black elephant rather than a black swan. But my ignorance before listening to Peter made me put black swan here. But I do think it is a potential, a potential game changer either way. And this is something that could allow ISIS to return. The reason is that, of course, the formula of ISIS has been very simple. ISIS, at least in the region, has, th has thrived wherever there was chaos and instability. It thrives wherever Sunni Muslims feel disenfranchised and marginalized. That was the formula for its success in Iraq and Syria. That's why people supported ISIS. And it's also what it has tried with varying degrees of success in Yemen and Libya and the Sinai. You can see that clearly in terms of the religious divisions and the conflicts they have given rise to. And none of the political problems that gave rise to ISIS have in fact been solved. And if, in fact, if anything, they've gotten worse. And there's more of a confrontation between Sunnis and Shiites now in the region, and more potential, in fact, for the situation in a number of countries to get ugly. And I think the situation may get worse in the country from which ISIS is currently being expelled, which is Iraq. As I mentioned before, ISIS remains in its strongholds. And just like in the late 2000s, it is biding its time. It is waiting for an opportune moment to come back. This is what Hassan Hassan, a very astute observer of the situation that has written a couple of days ago, he said the ISIS strongholds in Anbar were possibly easy to recapture, are likely to continue to be hideouts from where the organization can operate and launch attacks. These border areas, which can be described as the group's third capital after Mosul and Raqqa, are central to its post-caliphate strategy of hit and run operations. They were also where ISIS began its push into much of Iraq and Syria in 2014. We look at the map of the region. We, we do see the potential for conflict. We do see countries continuing to implode. If Iraq implodes as a country, and I think the chances for that remain 50-50, I haven't even touched on the Kurds and the impact they may have, then there could, be, could well be a situation where ISIS returns and we see a resurrection of the caliphate. And when it does, that would have an electrifying effect on recruits and it would allow them to feel like they have been vindicated. So in conclusion, there's plenty of reasons to believe that jihadism has a future, that the terrorism we have seen over the past few years will not simply go away. This will also clearly have implications for Southeast Asia and even for Singapore. 
the reach through information technology networks of people is well beyond the Middle East. You will have to watch very carefully how those networks of returning fighters are being dispersed. What's happening to people coming back not only to Singapore but also to Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines, but you're doing that anyway. It is also super important to watch how ISIS explains its own defeat ideologically, what jihadist supporters make of it. I personally believe there will be a crisis of sorts and that is underrated by analysts. The question is, what will ISIS do with it and where do its supporters go? Where do those supporters go that are not happy with the explanations that ISIS is providing? That's why it's important also to watch other groups. To what extent do they benefit from the decline of ISIS? What's their operational and strategic outlook? What will happen to al-Nusra? Will they swallow other groups? To what extent do they remain committed to focusing on local conflicts, which they are right now, as opposed to other parts of the world? Finally, of course, what's happening? Finally, of course, what's happening with the conflict in the region? What's happening particularly with Syria and Iraq, which despite the end of ISIS, will continue to be epicenters of conflicts in the region. I truly believe that what's currently happening in the Middle East, they are tectonic changes. They're perhaps comparable to the 30-year war that happened in the 17th century in Europe. The entire landscape is being recrafted. And I do think there are opportunities for extreme and for violent groups to reappear. In summary, I have no doubt there will continue to be jihadism, a jihadist movement in five or ten years. The people and the ideas haven't gone away. None of the political conflicts and fault lines that ISIS and Al-Qaeda have leveraged, none of these fault lines have been addressed. But whether that movement will continue to give rise to ISIS or to another group is impossible to say. And that brings me back in my closing remark to what, uh, what Chashi started with. In, 2011, many in the West made the mistake that they mistook a movement for an organization. When Al-Qaeda ended, they thought that was the end of jihadism. But jihadism continued and revived. It gave rise to another organization called ISIS. Now that ISIS is in decline, let's not make the same mistake again. Just because a group declines doesn't mean the movement that produced it will also disappear. That wasn't the case in 2011, and that won't be the case now. Thank you very much.